Oh, Marta, I can just do a quick bio, has been an associate professor at the Center of New Technologies at the University of Warsaw since 2015, where she heads the Wild Urban Evolution and Ecology Lab. And her research focuses mostly on the ecology and evolution of wild vertebrates in human-dominated environments using long-term study of great tits in a gradient of urbanization in the city of Warsaw. Uh, thank you very much for this introduction. So um, today I'll be talking about um, urbanization and the possible impact of urbanization on the avian gut microbiota. And I'm very happy to be talking after a talk that uh, sets uh, the, urban, the microbiome in a domesticated context. And I will just move on uh, for to a more basic science in the sense, basic urban uh, science um, that we can observe uh, around us. So uh, since our original times, we are ecosystem engineers as humans. And since our original times, uh, we have transformed the land and with increasing speed. And we have transitioned from savannas to uh, a context of the agricultural revolution 12,000 years ago. And now more than half of the human population is uh, gathered in cities. Uh, and um, a few years ago, I was very inspired by an opinion paper by Alberti and colleagues asked, uh, asking the question of whether the vertebrate gut met metagenomes can confer rapid ecological adaptation. And what's very interesting is in this review is that it's very much focused on uh, questions that were very relevant at the time that are still very relevant, but uh, that's focused mostly on climate change and agricultural uh, changes to the landscape. And uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting to note that since that time, um, research on the urban space has uh, really uh, increased uh, exponentially. And uh, well, the question is whether um, urbanization is actually a good context to uh, ask these questions um, and to essentially um, to test these hypotheses more in the urban space. So in this talk, that's exactly what I'd like to, to do and is to convince you that the urban space is uh, really a fantastic study system to study the, the gut microbiome. And to do that, I'll present the work that um, the Wild Urban Evolution and Ecology Lab has been uh, researching for the past six years, uh, which allows to set ground for a more comprehensive uh, microbiome work. So for disclosure, I'm an evolutionary ecologist working in the urban space. I'm not a microbiologist, but I, I'd like to show you how this ecological context, I think, is incredibly amenable uh, to understand, to characterize the microbiome dynamic that can be radically altered by the urban environment. So what we've been doing in our lab for the past six years is to focus on two species of pastorine birds, the grated and bluted, who are readily um, uh, nesting in, uh, in nest boxes. And so they're, in a way, a gold standard for evolutionary ecology research. And I have combined two study system. Um, so nest boxes, over 500 nest boxes in a gradient of urbanization set in Warsaw. Uh, and also, so that way we can have fitness information and also a two year sampling effort in replicated cities and distinct different contrasted habitats within these cities uh, in Poland. So that allows us to gain insight into the repeatability of certain urban processes. And by combining both types of study system, we can then gain an inference on the full uh, picture of urban ecological genomics and to understand what is the directionality and magnitude of environmental change, phenotype, fitness, and genotype, and whether that actually gives us ground to, to speculate on, on the importance of microbiome dynamics uh, in, in the urban space. So I'll start with the environment and how can we characterize the environment uh, in the urban space? A really uh, convenient way of uh, doing that is by looking at uh, the, the amount of impervious surface area. So essentially it's the amount of concrete in the environment. So asphalt and, and, and concrete. And the reason why it's uh, very convenient is because it's highly quantifiable, repeatable and comparable across studies. It can be extracted from satellite sensors and you can quantify in exactly the same way any city around the world. So uh, that's, that's a very useful uh, dimension of the urban space that I'll be using throughout the talk. But of course this is, um, oh sorry, and so to show you at the same time how contrasted the amount of impervious surface uh, area is in a city, it's something that is intuitively perceived by all urban dwellers. But very often in older work, we have this tendency to use a dichotomy of comparing the urban space against a natural environment. 
But actually what a lot of older studies have been doing is to compare natural sites, so uh, suburban forests or natural forests outside of the city, against urban parks, which are also highly green uh, spaces of the urban environment. So what you can see here are essentially box plots of all the nest boxes that we have in our study sites, so over 500 nest boxes, set in uh, nine study sites. And you can see that the different types of habitats on the urban gradient will have, or actually in the urban mosaic, have a different amount of impervious surface within the vicinity of every nest box on the, in the study system. And what it shows you, first of all, is that the urban space is a true urban mosaic, but also that in this study site, uh, urban distance to the city center, so the closer we are to this office, so the sites have been ordered in a increasing uh, in decreasing distance to the city center. And you can see that uh, it does not correlate with the amount of impervious surface. And that was the aim of the study is specifically to delineate these two relationships. So distance to the city center doesn't necessarily correlate with the amount of impervious surface. And so again, I just wanted to come back that very often when we compare in studies urban sites uh, relative to natural sites, we're comparing uh, urban parks, which if you see are actually very low in terms of impervious surface. So the statistical power to detect some processes may actually be quite limited. And we really need to focus as well on these urban space that is actually not necessarily green and uh, that is perhaps a little bit more difficult to investigate such as residential areas or office areas but that can actually bring in some very specific uh, distinct profiles now in purpose surface area is um as a it's a proxy for an altered environmental uh, for for an altered environment and um so nest so Greatest and blue are passerine birds that are feeding caterpillars to their young when the young are in the nest box or, or in a natural cavity. And what you can see here are still from video camera trapping made by uh, Michela Corsini, who uh, essentially show that uh, what in a natural environment birds bring to the nest are these uh, green caterpillars. Now, if you look at the urban environment, there is actually a much wider range of food that is brought in. The birds are not necessarily, well, they ha certainly haven't evolved to uh, digest a lot of the anthropogenic food that is brought. For example, here you can see a piece of bread. And uh, essentially it leaves us with a lot of questions regarding the amino acids that are further uh, um, accumulated in, in the body and how uh, the gut microbiome may actually play a role, positive or negative, uh, in the assimilation of, of this very distinct uh, food. Now, the urban environment is also uh, very characteristic, and I'm presenting the environmental axis that I think can be relevant to possible uh, changes in uh, microbiome uh, community. So uh, the urban environment is also characterized by a very distinct uh, signature in terms of a metal pollution, trace metal pollution. And what you can see here, and this is work from uh, Marion Chatelain, who essentially used this replicated st uh, city system to show that essentially across every single city there is a, an increasing amount of copper, zinc and lead uh, that, um, that appears that is accumulated in the feathers of uh, adult birds. Uh, the closer you are to any type of city center in uh, the eight cities that have been surveyed. And what's interesting again is that you see a distinct image of the residential area and city center while uh, the urban parks and protected forests and suburban forests are usually have a different um, signature in terms of uh, metal concentration in the feathers. So summing up this environmental part, urban areas are highly heterogeneous, abundant in terms of impervious surface, and uh, contrasted in terms of food availability, temperature. Now, how does that uh, translate into any phenotypic or genetic uh, um, um, signatures? So these are very brief um, pictures showing that there is a radical change in the phenotype of nestlings 15 days after hatching with increasing amount of impervious surface area. The picture is true for both species that we are investigating, greatets and blutets, and no matter which you, you're looking at, essentially the take home message is, is that the more impervious surface you have in the immediate vicinity of the nest box, the lower the body mass at the time of uh, near, near the time when you are fledging. The, fit, the, the image is very similar in terms of fitness. Again, uh, the more impervious surface around the nest box, so this is calculated uh, for 100 meters around each nest box, the, the lower the fitness of the parents that have been breeding in any particular area.
Uh, and finally, showing you as well that there is a very distinct uh, genomic signature of urbanization that we have found in this multi replicated multi-city system. This is an output from a redundancy analysis from a, uh, an aphometric SNP chip genotyping uh, that has been uh, um, developed by the, geno the graded consortium. And essentially what you see is there is a very significant, there is a highly significant uh, genomic signature of impervious surface that is driving a change in allelic frequencies on the entire data set. However, if you partition this data set into distinct cities, you find that there is a distinct signature of ISA on the allelic matrix for more than half of the cities that are surveyed. So essentially four have a highly significant uh, signature of ISA, one is borderline, but we also need to bear into account that you then um, reduce the statistical power of your tests. So as a perspective, we have characterized that essentially there is a, a very clear signature of uh, urbanization that can that encompasses all aspects of urban eco evolutionary ecology and ecological genomics. And the question is, well, does how how does the uh, urban microbiome, well, how does the microbiome play into this picture of the very strong signal that is driven by urbanization? And so here I'd like to introduce a, a, a fantastic collaboration that, um, that I have established with uh, Andrew Marachi and Barbara Kaspers from the University of Dillefield, where we have essentially run a pilot study on um, uh, the characterization of the uh, avian gut microbiota in the great tit. Uh, and we asked essentially two questions. One is whether there is a, a distinct uh, uh, difference in the um, microbiota assemblage, whether depending on whether we take nestlings from uh, nest boxes uh, relative to natural cavities. Uh, and the second question uh, pertains to this uh, effect of urbanization per se. Now, uh, I just wanted to make a note that you can see uh, blue tits on these pictures, but of course, whether we're talking of blue tits or gray tits, both species are the gold standard of um, avian evolutionary ecology. And nest boxes have really been this fundamental uh, tool through which we can gain an insight into um, avian biology. And the question is, well, uh, we've been working uh, with the Jana Sudekan, Irene Dileche on asking, well, um, is it possible that there is actually a bias um, in terms of the biology that we can get out of nest box data relative to natural cavities. So the first uh, results that I wanted to, to share with you is that there is actually a, a difference in uh, alpha diversity, uh, depending on whether we're looking at uh, nest boxes and natural cavities. And there might be, a set, so there is a difference in alpha diversity, but not in terms of uh, differentiations so in terms of uh, better diversity. And the reasons why this may be the case, I still would like to caution that the sample size here is very small, but I wanted to draw your attention to the thermal profile of, um, of nest boxes and natural cavities. And if you see these graphs, this is essentially temperature variation over a 24 hour time span. And you can see that the, a natural cavity offers a, a highly homeostatic environment to the developing nestlings. It's pretty much stable across 24 hours. Well, if we're looking at an S box, you can see these very high, uh, uh, this, this strong amplitude and temperatures. So that might affect the physiology of the bird itself and downstream uh, impact on the microbiota of the gut. But there is also this possibility that um, if you see uh, these changes in amplitude, that there is a, a considerable amount of time in the day when the temperature is above 20 degrees. So there is also the possibility that some mesophilic uh, bacteria that are developing on the nest material uh, in the nest box might actually further uh, colonize um, the uh, the avian uh, gut uh, in in the nest boxes and less so in the natural cavities. So this is all room for uh, speculation, but it is a, an interesting result that should be pursued further. Now, uh, uh, another strong signal that we have detected is that essentially urbanization defined by ISA has a very strong impact on both alpha and beta diversity. So alpha diversity is lower in high ISA environments. And uh, if we are looking at the different correlates of impervious surface, which we know is sound pollution, light pollution is highly correlated with impervious surface area, we can see that there is actually a strong signal of urbanization that, uh, that uh, displaces uh, beta diversity in our data set. So 
Another interesting point that I'd like to mention is that uh, depending on how you define the urban space, whether we're talking about an urban rural dichotomy or whether we're taking a continuous impervious surface area uh, approach uh, or even a high low ISA approach, which does not necessarily correlate with urban rural distinction, we can actually get different answers. <clears throat> so this is a, a word of caution regarding uh, papers that uh, essentially, for example, in terms of um, alpha diversity, we found that the urban rule dichotomy does not uh, have any effect on alpha diversity uh, in the urban mosaic. But if we're actually looking at high and low ISA, we will find a signal in alpha uh, diversity. So these are the, the results that we have so far. And just summing up, we know that there is a pervasive negative impact of urbanization on pastoral biology, but we have also found a directional signal of anthropogenic structures and urbanization on the avian, um, on the avian gut uh, microbiota. And so I'd like to come back to this question, well, do then vertebrate gut metagenomes confer rapid ecological adaptation? And I am perhaps overly cautious, but I still think that it is essentially too early days to give a confirmative and definite uh, answer. But I'd like to outline in this final slide, what are the possibilities and how we can approach the subject to actually test um, a possible uh, adaptive role of the um, gut microbiome. So first of all, I think, <clears throat> sorry, we need a, a comparative approach where to ask whether urbanization is a driver of repeatable shifts in avian gut microbial communities. And for that, we really need uh, standardized protocols and standardized definitions of the urban environment to get a coherent picture. Because at the moment, we have a little bit of a, a scatter um, uh, image of knowing that there is definitely a signal, but uh, there are too few studies and we are still using very different frameworks to actually um, have a, a comprehensive uh, overview of the impact of urbanization on the gut microbiome. Uh, and the other very exciting approach, I think, is to take a more experimental uh, approach uh, where uh, we can ask whether the avian microbiota is actually an extended phenotype. Is it an extended genotype? And um, by um, using a cross-fostering approach, also in a vertebrate system, uh, just as our previous speakers uh, performed um, a common garden environment for kelp, we could uh, ask whether um, the gut microbiota assemblage is actually a heritable trait and to partition the environmental and genetic sources of variants. And by combining uh, quantitative genetics, genomics by looking at associations between the host genome and the gut metagenome, and finally, by looking at metagenomic expression, so by using metatranscriptomics and metametabolomics, uh, I think we could then uh, gain a more comprehensive view on whether um, the gut microbiome can confer an adaptive advantage uh, to uh, wild organisms in the urban space. And uh, if you are interested in the uh, urban uh, evolutionary thematic, I, I encourage you to have a look at this book. and in, in, as an anecdote, we were very keen at the time of um, conceptualizing the book uh, to actually have an, an article, a, a chapter on the urban microbiome. But at the time, there were just too few studies to, 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 to warrant a chapter. So I'm very much, uh, I'm delighted to see that this field is really growing. And if there is ever a second edition, I'm, I'm very sure that there will be a um, space for, for, for this new branch of urban uh, microbiome uh, biology. Uh, in, in such an endeavor. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, all the collaborators and all the Springfield assistants that have worked very hard to uh, contribute to this, uh, to this work. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Marta, for that. That was really interesting. We already have a few questions lined up. So maybe I'll, since we're short in time, I'll just shoot right through to them. Uh, one question is if you could reflect on how you think this translates to other avian species, not just insectivores, but carnivores or frugivores as they move into the city landscape. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's a, that's a very uh, good question. Um, uh, so definitely, uh, I think uh, how generalist or specialized a bird is might play a role in the extent to which also uh, it's um, gut microbiome uh, can um, alleviate or hamper adaptation to the urban space. But for the moment, there is only, uh, I would say five or six uh, avian species that have, been, uh, that have been looked at and mostly 
uh, pasturing birds. So I think that there is definitely scope for, uh, as I was mentioning, looking at a wider range of birds, uh, but also keeping in mind this need for a, uh, for a systematic framework on how we uh, test uh, these hypotheses, because I think that at the moment uh, we call urbanization different ways and we test them in different ways and that can actually obscure the picture a little bit. So it would be great to actually um, definitely have more species um, into the picture. Thank you. And there's another question, which is, do you think that also average potential foraging distance plays a role? Sorry, can, can you repeat again? Sorry, do you think average potential foraging distance plays a role? Um, I, I think that probably means so, in how the microbiome changes with the environment. Yeah. So uh, I would imagine that if there is a higher, a longer foraging distance, then there is a greater homogenization across the urban mosaic because they are sampling environments um, more uh, extensively. So I would then imagine that perhaps there is more, uh, there is less of an urban heterogeneity signal. So yeah, depending on the biology of the species, that might actually uh, play a role into how homogeneous or heterogeneous the urban signal is. Thank you. And um, probably we have time for one last question, which is, do you think that this can be used for some kind of environmental monitoring of urban environments, such as looking at uh, early effects of pollutants? Mm -hmm. Um, definitely. I mean, I think that uh, in, this is where these standardized protocols come in, I think, and this is why uh, I think that uh, your projects also at the EHI have been very inspiring, because if we um, manage to um, essentially use standardized protocols for many species uh, and we have the ability to monitor that over time, uh, we can get a very um, in-depth picture into possibly uh, changes in time. So I, I don't think necessarily in that case we would need a very large sample size at a particular point of time in time, but uh, the, the idea would be to um, to increase the number of species and to perform repeated measurements over time. That would be amazing. Yeah. And also to have a look, uh, sorry, at these changes in environments that are under that are under undergoing transformation, because we know that urbanization is occurring at a very rapid pace. And this is another question: is uh, the extent of whether uh, urban areas that have been urban for a very long time give a similar signature to possibly um, um, rural space that has been transformed in a much more rapid way? Yeah, I think that's a really good point is actually tying in this more temporal aspect to quantifying the urban environment and not just the spatial aspect of it. Thanks. Well, I think we actually do have time for one very quick question. <laughs> Sorry, I promise. And um, Ustaiska asked if you plan to change the nest boxes to make them more like the natural nests. Yeah, that's a great question. So I've actually seen, uh, but I think it's more like a nest box design in arc among architects that uh, there have been these ideas about having these fancy nest boxes actually made out of uh, tree trunks attached to, to a tree trunk. Uh, I don't think there is uh, any plan for the moment to, to change uh, the design of the nest boxes. This is another uh, problem for cons in terms of consistency that we need to keep also keep nest boxes that have, so for example, in um, study systems such as Cor in a Corsica or in Oxford or in the, in the Netherlands, uh, we've been using nest boxes, the same nest boxes over 50, 70 years. So I don't think uh, that would go down very well, but I think it's aware, I think it's important to have a greater awareness that uh, that these these elements can bring sources of biases and just, just, just be aware of them depending on the biological question that we're investigating. <laughs> 